Good morning, everyone, and welcome to today's FS Club webinar. We're looking today at financing a sustainable future while bridging the $2 trillion annual infrastructure investment funding gap. And we have as our guest today, Mark Worrell from EIX, States Investment Exchange. Mark has presented to us on occasions before, and we've been watching EIX over the years uh, with quite a bit of interest. And it's going to be exciting today to see as the business is now moving, uh, some of the, the realizations that Mark had many years ago uh, coming to fruition. Well, you'll know me, I'm Michael Minelli. I'm one of the directors of Zien. And it really is my privilege to get to introduce this series of webinars from time to time. And I can only do so because we have such a generous, tolerant, and a wide ranging, almost polymathic set of sponsors across technology, economics, and finance. And I would uh, like to thank all of them for allowing us to range widely and freely uh, across the subject area. And of course, today is certainly an area where we're going to see a lot of finance, but also a lot of technology and innovation, particularly as we are trying to handle uh, this infrastructure around all the issues to do with environmental, social, and governance type investment. Now, this morning's uh, format will be familiar to many of you. My job is to get out of the way as quickly as possible and let you hear from our expert, Mark. Um, Mark will be speaking for about 20 to 25 minutes, and there's quite a bit of time for Q&A, so please do participate. May I remind you to use the GoToWebinar question facility on the screen in front of you. Please don't email me, please don't text me, because I'm here with you, um, but I will feed the questions and comments that you send through the chat room into a conversation with Mark. Uh, Mark will be receiving all of the questions with the emails of those who have sent them, so he can respond to you directly if you so wish. Uh, as you know, the slides are already up and available and will be available afterwards. So with no further ado, Mark, the floor is very much yours. Thank you, Michael, um, and good morning, everybody. I can't see you, which is a great shame. Um, I think the last time I did this was at Pewter's Hall, but the advantage is, of course, we all start on time um, rather than a bit later. Um, as Michael said, um, as I'm talking, sort of feels like I'm talking at you, since I can't see you, um, I'm going to talk for about 20 minutes. And uh, yeah, hopefully we can try and make this a little bit more interactive. So that will give us some time at the end so you can uh, join in. Uh, and I can hopefully answer some questions other than just uh, doing a speech. Um, unfortunately, at the moment, we can't really get away from, from COVID-19. And um, Obviously, I was reading the other day about the uh, the European largesse that has been handed out, which is teetering just on two trillion euros, uh, for example. And one of the key questions really has to be um, then how are we going to pay for it all, not just for our sakes, but for the generations that come after us. Um, and one of the views is that infrastructure is a key, you know, is a key component of that solution uh, and how economies can really start to move around it and how do you invest into them. However, it's not going to be easy to do this um, without private sector capital. The, obviously, the governments have been spending too much money on, on us and, of course, on the 2008 crisis. So there really has to be a way of uh, catalyzing that capital to come in from elsewhere. Um, and we think we can help to do that as a new exchange. So for those of you that don't know us at all, we are a new UK based FCA regulated exchange focusing on global infrastructure projects. Um, we take a project, whether public or private or a mixture of both, put them in an SPB and wrap them in a bond, which we then list on, the new, on this new marketplace. Um, the journey we are on is fundamentally to turn infrastructure from an investment asset class into a tradable asset class. And that will lead, we hope, further flow of projects as people who want to build things, whether they be governments or indeed private enterprise, um, actually find a way of getting, having a better experience of getting hold of capital and, be, and for the investment people actually to have a better ability to spread their risk uh, and whether they're buying or selling the asset itself. So there's an element of liquidity. Um, to date, really, um, infrastructure has not benefited from the whole array of debt capital markets uh, ability to really work in its favour. And what I mean by that is, if you look at an infrastructure project today, they tend to be financed on an individual basis. 
So what happens is when you bring the project to your bank or to your uh, to your investors, what you have to do is to actually have a reasonable offtake agreement, a rating, or indeed a uh, insurance wrap, or a mixture of all of the above. And really, there's no other way of offsetting the risk before you make it bankable, if you will. Um, so what happens is uh, you have none of the and benefits that other asset classes have themselves. So for example, whether there's options or credit derivatives, et cetera, they just simply would be too expensive to put together on an individual basis. And the reason for that is there's simply there's no marketplace for you to go to that actually can help you to achieve that quickly. So um, at the moment, there's really been very little impact uh, for such a big asset class, um, which has benefited from for financing infrastructure. Um, given the size, which is surprising given the size of the market. So if we look at some individual facts, for example, there is, as, my, as Michael said at the beginning, there is a two trillion, two and a half trillion US dollar funding gap per year. And it's growing year on year. In fact, I imagine during COVID, it's probably, we obviously we don't know how much it's grown by, but I imagine it's grown even further. Uh, and this is creating a backlog and it's forecast, as I say, to get, to get much worse, um, which is going to be, you know, it's going to need really the pension funds and others to step in. But the, the way the market is structured at the moment doesn't really allow them to participate because they actually have to put up quite a lot of money into individual deals. Mark, um, should we, um, so, shall we, should we just uh, have a, you wanted to just see what the audience thought the rankings would be? Oh, yeah, sorry. Sorry about that. Yeah. So um, do you want me to read the question? So the question was, if global equities is the most important asset class for asset managers, what is the second? And the answers are corporate bonds, uh, private equity, infrastructure, or high quality equities. So the poll is open. Um, folks, if you just uh, press there on the uh, questionnaire area, getting a, it's quite a fast audience, Mark. Uh, half of them have already voted. So uh, just, just give us a few more seconds here. Yeah, no problem. Um, Fantastic. Well over half. I'm going to close the poll in just a few seconds as we get over to the three quarters mark. Okay, and I'm going to show you the results, which is uh, interesting. So as you can see, uh, corporate bonds is what people thought was about 65%, private equity at 30%, and this infrastructure area, they estimated at only 5%. But I think you, yeah. um, you have something to tell us. Is that right? <laughs> well, actually, from a not not a survey that was commissioned by us, but a survey that was commissioned by PEI, um, which is one of the more important groups within infrastructure, polled 100 over 150 pension funds globally, and uh, infrastructure in their poll um, came out as being second next year. Um, which I'll come on to in a minute. So whether that's right or wrong, certainly, um, as far as I'm concerned, it's certainly on the rise, which I think is the important trend analysis uh, there. Um, thank you all for answering. Um, so where was I? So just, um, so as I say, there's a two and a half trillion funding gap, that creates a backlog. Secondly, um, the capital actually to create the funding that we need is already in the system. Uh, financial institutions manage over $120 trillion of assets globally. Um, so it's only less than 2% that you would need to actually cover uh, the asset gap that we've got in the world today. Um, and thirdly, um, there's an asset illiquidity mismatch at the moment, um, as we know, because the yield curves from government treasuries has been going uh, the wrong way for pension funds. Uh, and actually, the question is, is where do you get good long dated paper from? Um, obviously, corporate paper might work, but obviously the bulk of, in, of infrastructure projects will be longer dated uh, and actually provide a decent return. So you're talking about even in, in Western economies, you're talking of yields of maybe as two to three uh, percent um, for, for 10 years and, and even higher. If obviously you're talking to emerging economies, uh, even if they're led by the World Bank. Um, and obviously, you know, it's important that we look at the sustainable argument. Nowadays, pensions are looking, there's something like 20% of their holdings are held in ESG and sustainable in sustainability in some shape or form. And obviously that's going to increase. And it, you know, obviously in the UK, there'll be the usual political piece on that with you, uh, the COP26 uh, advent this year, um, which obviously the UK government's already pushing quite firmly. Um, however, at the moment, infrastructure has a, a very 
inefficient marketplace. Um, and um, I think probably an economist, although there might be some here that might disagree with me, would define that is that is the pricing of a market being random in nature. Um, there's no rhyme or reason why something does happens. Um, I'll give you a couple of stories. So um, the first one is um, I was talking to a CEO of a major port, container port, um, and they were looking for cleaner and greener in their operations. Uh, and what happened was that they ended up with having money offered um, with a 5% or 500 basis point spread between two and a half and seven and a half percent for the same tenor of money. Um, and obviously that's a huge gap and obviously gives rise to the inefficiency of the marketplace. Um, the other way you can look at it is there is a, um, a funding group, uh, New Marketplace, which Sorry, lost my train of thought there for a minute. So one of our first bonds is a hyperspectral uh, satellite, uh, which allows us to measure levels of acidity in global coral reefs and land around mines, etc. And you form, if you form a literal, literal form, if you like, of measuring actual sustainable standards from 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 space uh, as we move forward. And so you start to actually bring together those elements that start to look at how you can actually make something. But at the moment, that's not available. Um, so. A new marketplace brings together a focus that allows us to catalyze change. And when our first bonds, as I say, is this satellite. And we've also got four or five other bonds that are actually listed on Frankfurt at the moment that are going to list on EIX in order to create um, a further reading uh, in terms of um, how we might create liquidity for those and people can buy and sell them. So in order to bring to life, we need your active participation as market participants. And four initiative, four, we've got four or five initiatives that we that we need to bring to life. So the first is price transparency. The second is liquidity. The next is diversification through syndication, data to help bring the right information and intelligence to be able to make decisions. And of course, how to establish good market practice when it comes to sustainability, as I said before. So in terms of price, the first one, price transparency, we need a place or a platform, a marketplace where risk can be priced correctly. This allows us and people to begin to really understand the dynamics between risk and price. Uh, this will enable investors in, in, in all cases to have more confidence and therefore invest in different projects in different locations. And the way we do that is to have corporate advisors um, who, if you like, for those of you that understand the A market, what you would call them nomads, uh, we call them pilots. And what they do is they present the project to us um, and we really confirm, we run a grey market process to confirm five things. A coupon, tenor, the loan to value of the debt um, and the placement cost itself. So those, those four or five things are really important um, in order to establish that. And that goes to and fro, back and forward between the pipe, between the market itself where the auction is being held on the platform and the corporate advisor and the project sponsor who is who's trying to is the issuer of the bond. Um, so that process itself leads to the creation of a bond. Uh, and what we do at the end of that is we pass it over typically to BNY Mellon, although that's not doesn't have to, it's our default position, um, who actually then create the icing code, create the bond, and then list it onto the secondary instance of the marketplace. Um, and that will provide the opportunity for liquidity. It would be naive of me to suggest that you're going to have liquidity in the, on the exchange on day one, um, but over a period of time working with you, that is what will, will happen. Um, and what has become all the more part of this year is that I think that you will see that in um, since the markets went down in March, the liquidity will be a bigger factor in investment decisions going forward, ranking probably alongside things like risk and return as a measurement, um, which we haven't seen before uh, for this asset class. Um, the next one, of course, is diversification. And as I say, the ability to invest choice into an asset according to the risk adjusted view that the mandate allows you to is an important uh, one to build flow. So that should build a critical flow of projects for you to be able to invest in because you, they'll, meet, they'll know that money is available across the platform to do that. And it will bring the cost down for the project sponsor and the timelines for investment down to them. So, for example, for us, we can actually finance projects within 16 weeks, which is quicker, you know, especially as we all know, in the UK, at least, you know, getting a house bought and sold takes you at least 12 weeks in the first place. So if we can do this with an infrastructure project, that's pretty good. Now, we have a partnership that's burgeoning with um, Amazon Web Services, and that down the line, I believe, will enable us to do this even quicker by using machine learning to be able to 
even go faster with regard to how we create documentation. So if you like, we will have ISDA-like tiled contracts on the exchange rather than the bespoke 300 page contracts that you often see um, on in, in, on private placements. Um, the next really piece is we need to have a, conte a context within which these bonds can actually be traded and understood and priced. And that has to come from data. Now, unfortunately, I had when I first came up with the idea, um, expected that I could just plug the data feed from the exchange directly into the back of a Bloomberg terminal or indeed a Refinitiv terminal. Um, but actually there's very little contextual information available, news or otherwise, around infrastructure per se as an asset class. So we've had to actually look at it in a different way and start to see how we could do it. So the, what we've done is, again, partnering with AWS, and I underline the word partnering, um, where if you think of it as a utility, we're building a, a, a way of you being able to access data on the fly, the information that you need on different projects. And that, of course, that obviously that information provides the intelligence for you to be able to make investment decisions or buy and sell decisions. Um, and so to, at the moment, what tends to happen is people tend to coalesce around and cluster around only those assets in Western economies rather than actually look at emerging markets. Although we have begun to see some of the Canadian pension funds actually begin to look at emerging markets to find more yield um, because they can't find the number of assets to invest into otherwise. Um, so it's important, therefore, to think of that. And what we've done is we've built a schema um, of all the public procurement, 70 percent of the world's public procurement information to be available. Now, that will act as a lead or lag indicator. So, you know, if you were meant to order 100,000 bricks and you've only ordered 10,000, we'll know that you're probably running behind time. Um, and so that intelligence will fix that. But that's the first time that level of information and detail will be available in a single place uh, for you to be able to see. And then fifth, and then the last piece really is sustainability. And unfortunately, with sustainability, you know, whether we want to call it ESG, et cetera, one of the problems is, is there's lots of A standards, but there's no the standard at the moment. And the, the only way we've been able to think of it, and even talking to our friends, for example, a responsible investor, is that is to really start to create a market practice, if you like, to create a benchmark in order to enable us to really try and understand what it works and what doesn't work and what people like and don't like. And of course, on an exchange, that is, a, you know, is transparent in terms of the fact you can see it all the time. At the moment, we've chosen to work with the Climate Bond Initiative as a platform because it's an independent quango, um, and we think that's a good solution to it. Um, it won't be here tomorrow, but we think if you start to work towards you know, a green infrastructure, which is really deliverable, then you can maybe be able to start changing the way people practice it and even create our own benchmarks to measure it. Um, we believe that generally, um, if, if we provide a single global infrastructure exchange, which allows all types of investors to choose from a consistent flow of analyzed and rated projects that can be bought in tranches, which can be bought or sold whenever it's required. And the key to that is the liquidity. Can you buy and sell something before which you haven't done? And by actually catalyzing the market, we believe you'll get a greater quality project. We're not saying that we will be the market. What we're saying is that we will be an exchange like everything else. Not everything is going to be wanting to be listed as you don't list every company, but as a process which enables people to have some transparency through the market rather than just proxies. Um, you know, I've seen listed infrastructure funds which actually haven't changed the cost at which they lend money for 10 years um, at all. And that's probably more to do with the dividend policy of the company than it has to do with the pricing of infrastructure. And people are just taking that because they can make the margin. And that just tells you that there's a huge opportunity here for yield in the long, medium to long term, which hasn't been seen to date. Um, do we want to do you want to do that final poll? Um, you're on yes, mute, I think. Cool. Just give me a second there. Um, so we're going to look at the there we go. So what is the most important benefit asset managers expect from ESG investments? Lower portfolio volatility, a defensive portfolio targeting fat tail, straight far off risks, doing well financially and doing good socially good risk adjusted long term returns and i can't see the last one um, uh, diversification diversification okay and the poll is open folks um, 
very fast off the mark. We had 50% vote in 10 seconds, which is very good. And just give me a split second there, Mark, just letting the numbers creep up a bit. Sure. Okay, we've hit the three quarter mark. I'll close the poll in just a few seconds. Fantastic, closing the poll now, and I'll just uh, display the results if you give me a second. Uh, great. So uh, doing well financially and doing good socially, but uh, the right answer was slightly different, wasn't it? Yeah, it was um, diversification, wasn't it? Uh, no, it was good, good risk-adjusted long-term returns. That was it. So there you go. I got it wrong. Um, just, just what they want, which is uh, what they should like from any investment, really. Indeed. So um, really, just to, to finalise, I think... Um, if we can put this asset class on the map by creating an exchange, and if you will, we are as the um, as the um, uh, the maritime exchange is to to shipping, um, we are to infrastructure, and it's trying to create that initial focus really around the single asset class, so you can get that expertise from you know valuers, um, engineers, um, consulting engineers. Um, project financiers you know and, and drive the standards through the data uh, to make it a better a better understood asset class so therefore that makes it investable and the margins are truly astonishing i mean you're talking about from a trading point of view you know you're looking at 1990 margins in a in a world in 2020 um and that's you know should mean that we're, we should all be jumping all over it as an asset class there's low, there's plenty of money to be made in all assets, it's completely uncommoditized uh, and very little impact in terms of technology on it. And I mean that both in terms of the people that actually are building infrastructure, they're beginning to get better at it. Um, I had a conversation, I come from a data background primarily, and that conversation really has been around what do you do with your data? And one particular contractor told me that after three months, they throw it away. And I can tell you um, on the, uh, that, for example, the, the data that exists from Crossrail, um, which is now, um, you know, been handed over to TfL for data purposes. Actually, um, I can tell you that all of that data is sitting on a pair of tapes uh, or several tapes on a shelf in Brighton um, and actually has nowhere. It's nowhere near um, um, us being able to use it, although it's publicly available information. So there is a long way to go with this asset class. And my point is that that represents a massive opportunity. Um, both to create a more sustainable way of pricing it and trading it, um, and if we can pay pay our play our part in hoping to pay down for some of the pandemic um, and lighting this piece of the economy, um, as I said at the beginning, then perhaps we've got a, a real way of um, of making sure that we get the economies going so that our children and our grandchildren don't end up carrying the whole bill, um, and we at least we do our very best to to get out of the situation. And that's me. I'm done with. Thank you. Oh, wow. Welcome. But I'm very happy to take uh, questions. Great. Well, thank you very much, Mark. And in fact, we've got some questions here, folks. Do do type your questions in uh, to the GoToWebinar question facility. But just to get cracking, uh, sort of a point of information, Mark, from Hugh Purser. If the funding gap is uh, U.S. 15 trillion dollars by 2040, you know, what is this as a percentage of the total infrastructure spend? Um, I'm not sure I've got that number to to hand, um, but I I mean we I mean the gap at the moment as the as the as the heading suggests it's two and a half it's two two and a half trillion per year is the is the funding gap in the in the world, um, and as we know even if you look at American infrastructure or indeed UK infrastructure or German infrastructure, um, a lot of it is not is not is not is not being kept up. Let's put it that way. I mean, the, the, one of the one of the ways of actually looking at it is that 99% in the Western world, 99% of the infrastructure that is required is built. So actually, many of the trillions that are spent is spent on maintenance uh, rather than actually on construction. So it, the, the, one needs to get over that myth. Um, when you look at emerging markets, obviously it's 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 very different. Um, we know we're working with the World Bank, for example, on their city resilience program, and that's the deployment of approximately 65 billion dollars to 40 places around the world. And that can be as basic as providing, for example, solid waste management in a place like Dakar, um, or it can be as complex as trying to get, you know, half of a city like Puerto Alegre from flooding twice a year. So it, it really differs in terms of 
what you're looking at. Um, but I don't have that number to hand. But if if you if if you want the number, I can we can look it up, and I'm sure get back to you. Great. Um, Hugh continues. Um, an important aspect of liquidity is the spread. You know, the buy sell price spread. What is this looking like so far for infrastructure funding offerings? Uh, wide. <laughs> it depends on the asset, but I think it also depends what you mean by liquidity. And I think, you know, we've, we've got to be careful. Liquidity, obviously, if you look at an equities market, is something that you have in abundance because people make markets in it and you get a two way electronic trading price, if you will. In this asset class, I think it's it's probably more like market access and availability of the of someone to give you a price on a one off basis, on an auction basis. I think you have to start there. Uh, and it, liquidity can mean, as we know, different things to different people. So I think the things that we're concentrating on are things like fungibility, um, i.e. the quality of the paper that is being issued is tradable alongside other papers. So you could go long of a contractor and short of a project etc or whatever your strategy may be we'll be adding derivatives next year so for example optionality or credit derivatives so you'll be able to play around with credit risk in particular um, and that's going to that that will help to move that around so um, the idea at the moment is that in on a single price the, the, the spreads will be will be large but it will depend on where the asset is uh, and and the perception of that economy will be this main driver as, as in terms of its rating uh, Dan Garrity has uh, helpfully pipped in here he points out that the uh, to, to Hugh's question about the funding app as a percentage of the total infrastructure spend, it's about a 10 to 12 percent shortfall per annum in that infrastructure spend. But Dan also points out uh, it's likely to be rising quite significantly given the post-COVID impact. So thank you very much for that, Dan. Uh, Anita Miller is curious. Uh, Mark, could you elaborate on why the Canadian pension funds? seem to have this greater ability or appetite for infrastructure investment. So is this regulatory or something else? Um, well, the actual story was set up by the guy who originally, whose name I can't remember, but who actually set up the original OMAS um, fund. And he decided, um, this is several tens of years ago, decided that infrastructure was a decent asset class to invest into. That That's the main reason is they started to understand, invest in and understand the asset class more than others. OMAS tends to be, a pretty self-contained outfit actually compared to some of the others like um, uh, Ontario teachers etc um, so they they have they have an incredible amount of knowledge in-house and they've just invested in a lot of time in understanding it is the simple answer um, I think in the UK for example um, we haven't spent as long and and it's also part of the process we haven't actually allowed people you know if you if you pop along to one of the pension funds you're typically asking them to write quite large tickets in terms of risk size very few projects like for example Thames Tideway have been put together where it's actually been syndicated on a security basis so a lot of it's done as pure lending um, and that creates an issue for flow because if you know you probably if you want to invest in something you probably want to invest you know five to ten percent of it and some of, of course have very good you know tight mar um, mandates in terms of only perhaps being able to invest as much as a hundred million into a single project uh, and of course if you've if you've got that you know if you're trying to get two to three billion for a very large infrastructure project or even if you're trying to do you know one of the three four hundred million you know, it doesn't get you very far. You've got to find the other participants. And there just hasn't been a way of syndicating them cleanly without there being very long winded legal documents to go alongside it. And that's why we believe there's an opportunity to simplify it. Hmm. Um, Andrew Ross is curious, Mark, a sustainable city infrastructure is crucial. Um, do you have any thoughts on how municipal green bonds in the UK might be traded and what role would EIX have in that? Oh, municipal green bonds in the UK or municipal bonds in the UK indeed um, yeah I mean unfortunately at the, at the to date um, the as you know Andrew may well know is these obviously local authorities uh, have been you know mostly relying upon government and through the PL, P, PWLB program and we did try actually a couple of years ago to have make some inroads and try and show them that they could actually build assets and, and build out an as, a, a balance sheet um, through by using you know bonds either on our platform or bonds for the for their own sake and you could call municipal green bonds the same aspect um it's just had you know compared to the states and perhaps you can talk more about that um 
Professor, uh, than I can is, is, is obviously in the States, there's a much better balance um, between um, bond the bond market and the equity market. And I think there's just been a better habit um, of people uptaking that. You, we could go back as far as blaming the Marshall Plan if we really wanted to, um, in terms of, you know, the Americans obviously putting the money in through the banking sector and skewing the market. And so therefore, we've never really recovered from being overbanked in Europe, uh, I don't think. Um, so this is an opportunity absolutely to put it right. But I think the first thing is there needs to be a mindset at government level to stop providing them cheap money. It looked like it might was going to change at uh, one change was one stage last year when they um, when they looked at uh, putting the PWLB rate up. Um, but I think post in a COVID world, I, I'm not sure really that where that's going to end up. And having had some interaction with the cabinet office, I think there's only two things on their agenda, and that's COVID and Brexit. Um, so thinking of new ways of paying for things is you know, is, is, is difficult at the moment anyway. Yeah, well, I, I might put some of the blame, frankly, 30 years ago on the Hammersmith and Fulham decision to renege on obligations, which basically meant that nobody could trust the municipal market. Uh, and I think that's had a long term kind of over overhang uh, for us. But let's move on to more positive things. Uh, as you said, uh, Brexit and COVID. Um, uh, you can't deal without blockchain, I'm afraid. So there's a question here. You and I have chatted about this before, about EIX and yeah. its use of smart ledgers. Mm -hmm. But this is from Jeremy Wilson. Mark, do you see blockchain playing a, a role in new infrastructure like yours, which serve the fractionalization of non-financial assets? Though I'm not 100% sure these are non-financial assets. Um, yes, I mean... I mean, as as you just said from from Michael, I we, you know we we've been look we have looked at it, um, but I think we're sort of a stage too early. Um, we need to organise the asset class first, if you like, without being flippant about it or without being, you know, too you know full on about what we're trying to do. I, th I think that um, yeah. So I mean, I was talking only actually two weeks ago with a with a the first um, token driven bank actually in Switzerland in. Uh, in what I think they they refer to as Crypto Valley, um, and we had some ideas about how you might be able to bring certain investors, for example, that had invested in crypto, onto onto the platform. So that's one aspect in terms of tokenizing. But I think it happens a bit like the retail investors for us would be third hand. It would be asset managers investing professionally through institutional blocks rather than directly as retail. So I think that that deals with the token bit. In terms of the IT, if we're talking about ledgers and um, etc. I mean, we are sensibly blockchain enabled, if you want to call it that. Um, uh, and I think in due course, if there is demand from the practice that we have around us, then then, then we'll, we can easily move that way. Um, but we've been focusing on actually trying to get the, the critical pillars up and running first and deal with the underlying, the issuing of the underlying, which I think is important to drive the market. Mm -hmm. Um, a question from Bob actually out there on the issuances per sector, the, the slide that's up here today, there's a, you know, it's nearly 60% renewable energy. Do you, do you think that's the right sort of balance or what sort of balance would you be looking for in the future? Well, I think renewable energy lost, um, I think we were, it was, it was around 40. And of course, the reason why it's been, you know, um, globally, I think, I think the, the main issue there is that it's easy to price because you've got an uptake agreement so therefore, which is very clean so at the moment infrastructure and sustainable you know wherever it may be green uptake energy projects are on ice to price because you know where you're going to get your money back from um and obviously if you look at a road that's unless it's a toll road that's particularly you know can be more difficult to to look at so you might start to look at what people call you know land value capture or um look at uh, the economic benefit of a piece of infrastructure which has been something that hasn't been particularly well um, dealt with if you like within the context of financing a project because it's too complex for them to look at but hopefully you know if you start the debate you can get there um, but that's the reason why it's that those projects are particularly well sought after it's you know they're good returns and of course they did have until recently probably most around most of the western world pretty good government guarantees for long dated paper okay uh, Christopher Gleedle is curious. He, he, he says, large infrastructure projects are susceptible to the risks of cost overruns, project delays, benefit shortfalls. And for example, policies that promote public transport systems can be biased against rural areas. What do you have in place to measure the optimal performance of 
ESG returns on investment as well as financial return uh, to remove these negative impacts? Blimey, um, that's a big question. Um, okay, so um, I think one of, one, of, one of the main issues is um, that public projects in particular are, are typically uh, at the moment are priced in a way that affects the people that deliver them. So what I mean by that is typically a government or a municipality tends to go for the lowest price. So, but that doesn't necessarily mean it's going to get the best result, as we know from Crossrail or in the UK, or there's numbers of other projects that we can look at. So I completely take his point. Um, the way to get around that is actually through data. So, so what you need to prove is that the people who are in the pipeline, who are delivering those projects, actually can deliver them um, is not about the price, the cost per se, but actually is making sure that they get paid the right margin for the risk taken, or they get paid for the risk taken rather than just paid margin and seeing it as simple profit. Because what happens at the moment on major projects is that the minute the the, uh, the ink is dry on the main contract, they start to unpick it to try and work out how they make more money out of it. And that just means we're not paying them the right level of price. So what we would hope over time is that the data components of what's available through the exchange and its data business would actually start to allow you to see what, how you should price that project in order for it to be delivered on time and on budget. So that's sort of the, a different starting point is starting in the right place rather than the wrong place. Um, the ESG piece of it, um, I think he, meant, he mentioned in there. I mean, obviously, that's about at the moment. That's about um, applying ESG standards, whether that be the Climate Bond Initiative, whatever. And that really works as a rating. So you have to have that. A bit like having a quantity survey around. You'd have to have a quantity survey around to check that you, on a continuous basis through the lifetime of the project or the bond, to enable you to actually check that they are meeting those criteria and that it remains, you know, a sustainable ESG type project. And as I say, the, the earlier on the trick with that is that there's lots of a standards there's no the standard so the question is is what is the right way to go and what is really green and what isn't and you know how do we establish the right the right greenness if you like or esgness for for a project um in terms of um the, the more mundane way of making sure a project's delivered you have, obviously you you do it as tranche delivery so you can't actually have the money unless you've actually fulfilled the next step in the infrastructure project on drawdown um, and a quite a good example of that is actually which we use and we have presented for example at places like the world bank um is is again i'll come back to its thames tideway because it was a publicly listed bond that actually we asked for the first time actually to the financial institutions what would they like whilst taking the risk away from um the the tails were dealt with by the uk government so those are the exceptions rather than the rule uh, which is slightly different structure from the way crossrail was run um, so I hope that kind of gives. I'm happy to have a longer conversation with him if he wishes, but that's kind of maintenance. But it's about it's a you know, you've got to look at it very carefully, and um, um, and that's some of the standards that we hope to bring in. You know, we're working with the market. We're not going to do it on our own. Well, very good. Well, uh, Chris Beadle um, email will be sent to you. Um, you know, a lot of this project is is really about data, and I I totally agree with you. This idea that unlocking the data is is absolutely crucial and important. Um, but we've also seen sort of a, a proliferation of taxonomies. And in your work, you've been looking at how do I taxonomize some of this data to make a horrible verb. Uh, but we've also got things in Europe, like the International Platform for Sustainable Finance, which is also pushing huge uh, European taxonomies. Um, so just to get the other B of Brexit in here, <laughs> post-Brexit, Mark, you know, how do you see this taxonomy situation playing out because a proliferation of taxonomies isn't helping anyone um so we're not i mean we're not we're not imposing a taxonomy on anyone other other what we're trying to do is get the data to be in a single place and i think if you look at you know if you were to build a bloomberg today you wouldn't build it the way it was built when it was um, you build it differently. And I think what you're beginning, what we will move to, and there's been several companies like, for example, Snowflake in the United States and others that have begun to look at consumption of, an, of data on a utility basis. So I don't mm. think it's so much the, the taxonomy. So if you like, in our case, AWS is the, is the if you like, the national grid, and, and we are supplying for infrastructure, 
a, a view. Now we can adopt, you know, any taxonomy that doesn't really matter. Or indeed, you can drop our data into whatever you know framework you would wish to have it in. Um, but you're you're right. I mean, unfortunately, I think at the moment. I mean, I was discussing with the, the chairman of our advisory board the other day. You know, we were talking about maybe it'd be better to go for blue bonds rather than green bonds because there's so much confusion around green. You know, would it be easier to just name it blue and start again? Um, you know, there's, I mean, I think that the reality is we, we are where we are. Um, Michael, we're just going to have to try and coalesce around that. I mean, that's why we're talking to the UN, you know, around those standards and trying to see, you know, again, the World Bank and other, in, in, you know, either EBRD, et cetera. And it's about trying to, and obviously EIB has a program, you know, a very good program of bonds that they've been issuing for some time now um, that they that they deal with. Um, I think the case is that you have to keep pushing, and and as we know, as we know with other markets, it's taken a long time for the standards to really wear bear out. Um, but you know, it, you have to do. You can't if you just keep talking about it, nothing will happen. Now, Mark, uh, states and infrastructure exchange. I've been watching for ages. In fact, I think I did a video uh, with you eight or nine years ago, even. So it's mm -hmm. been a, a road, and your determination has has made it a. Uh, a success, frankly, but what what's the biggest milestone you see coming ahead for you in 2021? Uh, the listing of the of the first bonds on the on the exchange um, just going into Q1. Very good. That's going to be the, the bigger because it'll bring it'll bring the whole thing to life. Okay. Um, and in any, oh sorry, go ahead. No, go on. no sorry, come. I, I mean, in any market, there's this. Uh, what makes marketplaces difficult is this inherent balancing of supply and demand, which meets them squarely on their shoulders. Um, where do you sit at that moment? Have you got far too many projects or far too few investors or what's the situation? Um, so I think on the project side, the issue is trying to find um, ready bankable projects. Um, that's the first thing. And there's two, there's two ways over that. One is don't think of them as all as construction projects. I mean, quite a lot of the things that we're looking at are refinance or dual listing. So that's so think, think they're, they're seeking different things um, is the answer on that side. Um, on the money side, actually, there is there is very good appetite, especially post COVID. I think there's even greater, as I pointed out earlier on in one of the with the poll that we, we, we know actually infrastructure was the second in that particular um, piece of research, uh, which surprised me. I have to be honest, I thought it would rise. I wasn't I was surprised to see it was second behind equities. Um, but you know, be it as be it as may, I mean, what the money the money is looking for yield. They've got a big asset liability imbalance at the moment, and you know, the yield the yields for some time now. I mean, pre COVID, I mean, even going back, you know, to about 24 months before that, they, you know, the yield curve wasn't the right way around for them to meet, you know, the minimum investment guarantees, particularly in Germany and stuff. And so, um, yeah, I think we've seen, you know, you, there is a huge demand. But what is wrong is that you can't keep taking them individual risk projects. To invest into when they've got hundreds of millions of pounds to invest in a single, in a, in a, a, which which is then mandated in a particular way. You've got to provide the flow, and I think what we're trying to solve is this flow. Um, and once you've got that, to answer your question, I think you'll have quite a good balance between the availability of capital and the the projects that are there, because you've constructed them in a way that enable them to buy tranches rather than and therefore syndicate rather than them and therefore diversify risk because they've got a flow of projects on a continuous basis. And that's going to help them to be able to make it a more investable asset class and perhaps catch up with the likes of the Canadian pension funds, as we mentioned earlier. Very good. Well, sadly, we come to the end of time, but I, I will say uh, again that I'm enormously supportive of what you're trying to achieve at EIX, having chaired a property company for nine years and coming out of the financial sector I was appalled at the uh, lack of data, the lack of comparable data, the lack of project data, the lack of financial data. Everything seemed to be bespoke and anything that cracks us out because construction and maintenance, as you point out, are huge areas uh, of the economy and ones that really do need a lot more efficiency in them. But the way to break it out, I think, is, is largely by what you're doing, which is to relate it tightly uh, to the financial and to the other wider societal ESG factors. So, Thank you so much um, for that. Anyway, sadly, thank you, Michael. Um, we have come to the end. All I, was going to, all I was going to say, thank you to you, but also thank you to the attendees. And of course, if um, if they want to know more or want to join in the 
the, the, the fun. Um, that's really what it's about. We won't become a marketplace with us just standing there in the middle, hoping they're going to come. So feel free to please to, to join in and help us. Very good. Now, I just have three rounds of thanks, if I might. Uh, first, of course, to the sponsors. Uh, surely uh, this enormous growing area is going to be crucial to all of us in technology, economics and finance. And what Mark is doing is to bring out uh, transparency in that sector, which I think will make it uh, something we'll want to be returning to in uh, the years to come. Um, I'd also like to thank you, the audience. You've been very good today as ever at uh, popping in your comments and questions. Uh, a look ahead uh, at the webinars that are forthcoming. I just might point out tomorrow uh, we have a fascinating one on looking ahead to 2021. Uh, it is the Brexit webinar before the end of the year, but we're going to look at moving beyond Brexit in financial services regulation with Baker McKenzie. And I think uh, we can finally start to have a good hard look at what Brexit really means as the dust is settling there. Uh, I'll leave you to check out the website for the rest. Uh, but very finally, Mark, uh, an enormous thanks to you. Um, you. You seem to be becoming a bit of a regular as we watch your little baby progress and toddle <laughs> along and take its first steps. It's really good. Um, and I'm afraid I can't, as you pointed out earlier, open the floodgates of audience applause. But I do, in fact, have my little Korean uh, <laughs> here. Um, he would. A karmic <laughs> clapping mechanism from a temple in Bulgoksa. And so on behalf of the audience, if I may, thank you very much. We hope to have you back thank again. You. Thank you very much. Much appreciated. Thanks for support.